what do you think about the state of Chinese science at like the higher level? So something, one thing people will say will be like, oh, China can produce a lot of STEM graduates. Um, you know, they could do well, average, you know, the population mean on standardized tests, but like, you know, the highest level physics or the highest level engineering and or the highest level math, that's still um, an American advantage. Um, we, we, you know, what's, what's your impression there? That is a great question. And, and, and the answer to that question you know, again, this is the advantage of having been around for a while. So, you know, I've been a professor now for, I don't know, 30 plus years or something. So I, I can actually tell you how it's evolved in the last 30 years and then make a projection going forward. Now that the single most, uh, you know, if, if there's one takeaway for your audience, uh, which uh, I could give, it's that if you make an estimate of the number of high ability STEM PhDs, in China, uh, in the near future, compared to the United States, it could be an order of magnitude larger. Mm. We're not talking about like two times larger. We're talking about ten times larger. So, you now how do I get to that number? Well, uh, the population base is four x. Um, the fraction of the population that can master kind of advanced mathematics, like do well on the PISA math, you know, score at the highest level on the PISA math. Uh, test is is also a multiple of you know that tail population in the United States or at, rel, per capita, and um, furthermore, I think students are about twice as likely to major in STEM in China as they are in the United States. So it's easy to get a, an order of magnitude out, like a factor of ten, mm-hmm. and that's for real. If you then start looking at the numbers more carefully, you realize yeah they're producing ten times the number of high level technologists in the United States. Um, now. That is just starting to happen now. So if, if 20 years ago I went to a Chinese university, even the best ones, there would be very, very few world-class researchers there. Very few. There would be people who are competent to teach a student, say, to the master level, master's level, and then that person could come to Berkeley or Harvard and get a PhD in the United States. Um, that was certainly the case 20 years ago. Now when you go back, there will be many, many labs on the campus that are doing world-class work. And often the guy who's running the lab, not always, sometimes the guy running the lab was trained in China, but often the guy tra- running the lab was trained at, you know, Georgia Tech and went back to China. So it, it's a moving target, but it's moving very strongly in a certain direction. Um, I was speaking to a venture capitalist who held a very senior position uh, at Microsoft for many years, who's originally from China, and he's a computer scientist. And uh, he was telling me things like, well, you know, the archive, A-R-X-I-V, um, where, you know, papers in physics and math and computer science are posted, um, you know, an American invention, you know, it dates back to the early 90s. But the, the archive is where these papers, you know, the top AI papers will go there and things like this. Um, he says, you know, in China, there's this the equivalent of Stack Overflow, which is a, a site which exists to discuss certain topics or questions or ideas in technical subjects. He says there's equivalent of a stack overflow discussing the top archive papers, which is completely in Chinese. It's completely in Mandarin. Mm-hmm. And so if you're a Chinese engineer and you speak English and you also read Chinese, you, you have access to like two deep pools of technical knowledge. Like you, you can see a whole Chinese analysis of, okay, how well did these transformer uh, uh, units, modules work in this particular AI image processing, you know, implementation, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see the Chinese discussion of it and you can see the English discussion of it. And I'm reminded of when I first started as a, in physics, uh, it was still, there was still a hangover of the Cold War. And a lot of people were still learning German and Russian mm. because there was lots of stuff published in Russian journals that you couldn't get access to unless you could read Russian. My father had to learn German and I think, I don't know if he studied Russian, but he definitely had to learn German uh, as part of his PhD at the University of Minnesota. Um, so there is that dual kind of uh, reservoir uh, structure evolving now where there's a separate technological reservoir of information in China. Um, and it's still in the early phase now, but in, in some particular areas like AI and software, it's, it's advancing very fast. Um, maybe some areas like uh, hypersonics and things like that too. So um, I think it's for real. I think I think they're going to catch up and, you know, maybe they won't surpass us because the West has a much longer history of really the highest level, most creative kind of scientific activity. And it will take a while for them to catch up. It took Japan a long time to catch up. So the Japanese, if you look at their progress, they were playing catch up for a long time. And it's easier to catch up in applied sciences and engineering 
and harder in this really kind of creative, purely scientific kind of stuff. But if you look at Japan performance in Nobel Prizes, it's really accelerated a lot in the last few decades. Mm -hmm. And that's a that's a lagging indicator. So I actually think that that final step, it's not clear when they'll finally, you know, uh, draw even with, uh, say, the West or the United States. But in terms of like technological innovation, uh, 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 implementation of big engineering projects, stuff like that, I think they're already at parity. Yeah. Yeah. So I, you know, another question I, you know, I wonder about is that I know in a lot of countries, I know Korea is like this, that the American universities are sort of seen as like the most prestigious in the world. So we talked about the sort of the psychological, um, you know, the sort of the psychological effect of people thinking, you know, Westerners are are number one and will always be number one. I mean, that's the U.S., uh, um, you know, that's sort of the U.S. perspective. Um, if you're like, you know, the, one of the you know smartest people in, in China now, you know, if you're a young person and you're going to college, is something like Harvard still sort of seen as like, you know, the, the, the main thing you should aim for? Or do the Chinese universities in the minds of, uh, you know, Chinese people, young people particularly, uh, do they have that sort of, you know, prestige? Because Xi Jinping's daughter went to, went to Harvard, did she not? Or is she, is she still there? Yeah, I, I, you know, I, think, I think she went to Harvard, right? Um, she did go to Harvard. Yeah. Um, but I'm not sure she's part of the actual intellectual elite in China, yeah. but but um, definitely part of the elite, but uh, sure. maybe not the intellectual elite. So, you know, if you define some cutoff, like, okay, you're at the one in 1,000 or one in 10,000 capability level, say for STEM, like intellectually or for STEM or something, um, what does the world look like to a Chinese kid? I think most of them are going to want to try to get into the top Chinese universities. They're going to want to get into Tsinghua or Beida or Zida, basically the, the top layer of Chinese universities. But then the next stage right now, they would seriously consider trying to come out to you know MIT or something to do their PhD. Mm-hmm. And then they have a lot of optionality because they could stay in the US and they could start a company in the US, start a company in China, get a faculty job in the US, get a faculty job in China. By coming out, they get a lot of optionality. Um, now, one thing that people, I think, underrate, so so Westerners who go to China, they realize like, shit, it is pretty tough to learn Chinese. Yeah. Like the number of Westerners who are really fully fluent in Chinese is very small. It's equally hard for someone who grew up in China to learn English. Mm. So, you know, my father, who was a professor of aerospace engineering, he always spoke with a very thick accent and he, he would... Uh, you know, not put the articles in the right place because there are no articles in, in Chinese. Yeah. So he would never, he he was never fully fluent in English. And that was always a handicap for him uh, working in the United States, living in the United States. Well, because of the linguistic challenge, there's always going to be some inertia where even if it's, there's a big gain from coming to the United States, some fraction of people, even people who say who are really good at math, will just prefer to stay in China. And we're finally getting to that tipping point. So, for example, there's very little immigration to the U.S. from Japan now. No, very few Japanese want to come to the. I mean, they want to come to the United States and visit, but there's not a lot of net immigration from Japan uh, to the United States. Even though maybe, like you could say, like incomes are higher, the quality of life is higher in the United States. It's not as crowded, you know. But the main reason is that the the barrier to get yourself to the point where you can function well in this alien society is. It's quite, there's quite a big uh, factor there. And so I think you're going to start to see fewer and fewer Chinese who want to permanently come to the United States. I think that's going to be a diminishing uh, you know, pool of people over time, yeah, barring some kind of collapse or some nightmare scenario in China. Yeah. 